Bring us all the latest in the ever-escalating conflict in the Middle East. Is former British commander Richard Kemp live from Tel Aviv. Richard, thanks so much for coming on the program. Um, I want to start here because Rita had just mentioned the media class here and how they misreport so much of what goes on uh, in the Middle East and in uh, between Israel and the Palestinians. There's just been a report come down about the BBC and the way they have mishandled their coverage of the uh, Israel-Palestinian conflict since October 7th. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, I've, I've, uh, I've read this report that's just been issued, and I've, um, I've also been watching a fair bit of BBC coverage since the war began. Painful, though, it is to watch, because there is no question in my mind that every time the BBC covers the war out here in Israel, it is horrifically biased towards Hamas. Uh, there's always undue criticism of Israel, and they go easy on Hamas. There's no, there's no doubt in my mind that is a consistent editorial policy. And it's been that way with the BBC for a long time, not just during this conflict, uh, but certainly since I can ever remember BBC covering the Middle East. There's, there's just... An ex and it's, it's not even necessarily only a factual bias, but it's also in the tone of their reporting and the way that they uh, try and interview, for example, IDF spokespeople and things like that. Always, um, uh, it's at least the implication that the the Israeli spokespeople are uh, are lying, and that's 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 the kind of impression you get. And this report has essentially, I think, borne that out and suggested that I think since the war began, at least 1,500 times the BBC has breached its own editorial guidelines for impartiality on the conflict over here. Shocking. And of course, in the UK, you have to pay for a license to watch the BBC. I think that's a shocking dereliction of people's money. But anyway, Rita. Um, switching to the US and the, the support they're providing to Israel right now, but the Biden-Harris administration seems to be wavering. We had Biden even uh, this week come out and say that Netanyahu isn't doing enough to secure a ceasefire. Explain what's happening in that relationship and what the impact is on, on what Israel does next. Yeah, I mean, th this is one of the key issues here in Israel at the moment is, is the, the ceasefire oblique hostage release negotiations that have been going on for a considerable time now. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned, just recently, President Biden suggested that uh, Netanyahu is not doing enough to get the hostage released. Yet, in recent weeks, and in days, recent days, in fact, the deputy director of the CIA has praised Israel for, um, for, for going pretty much all the way, as far as it can possibly go in terms of, of compromising on negotiations. And the same is true of Secretary of State. So there's mixed messages coming out of, of Washington. And the Prime Minister over here, Prime Minister Netanyahu, recently spoke to try and clarify the situation, which is that effectively they're, they're the ones that have shown flexibility mm. Mm. Uh, as much as is possible. And it's not possible to be to completely uh, accept all of Hamas's terms, but Hamas have been completely intransigent. One of the key issues that is being discussed here is the Philadelphia Corridor, which is essentially the border between Gaza and Egypt, which Israel is currently in control of. It's a lifeline for Hamas. Mm. And there's some people who suggest that uh, the IDF should withdraw from that corridor um, in order to encourage Hamas to come to some kind of deal. Other people, like the Prime Minister and some of the people around him, say this can't happen. This is, this is basically our you know, most probably the most critical ground in Gaza for, for, for completing the mission of destroying Hamas in Gaza. James McPherson. Richard, we're all aware that Iran, of course, is stirring up trouble in the region. But I want to ask you about Turkey, because overnight the president of Turkey has met with the leader of Egypt and he has said there needs to be an alliance of Islamic nations against Israel to stop what he calls Israeli expansion. Can you believe yeah. it? Can, can you talk to me about... Turkey's involvement in this? Is this just hot air or is this a serious threat from Turkey? I think there's a great deal of hot air has come out of Turkey since this conflict begun, began. And, and, you know, even beforehand, Turkey was talking about 
Jerusalem belongs to us. We, we, we you know, it's, it's Turkish territory. And of course, it was at one point, the Ottoman Empire did control this entire territory, but that was in the distant past. So I think my view is that this is more than anything else with hot air. I don't think there's a real threat from Turkey against Israel. Obviously, there is diplomatic. Um, but of course, Turkey is a member of NATO. Mm. And for Turkey to do anything aggressive against Israel would be met with, you know, considerable, I think, displeasure from the United States. Um, as for Egypt, Egypt, Egypt's been playing a double game. Egypt uh, facilitated uh, the, the, the arming of Hamas. It, it, enabled, it allowed Hamas to bring weapons, munitions and equipment to turn Gaza into a, the, fortif the fortification it is today. Um, sometimes maybe by playing a blind eye, sometimes by openly allowing stuff through. But nevertheless, uh, it was really because of uh, Egypt's position that Hamas developed as it did, supplied by Iran, but allowed through by by Egypt. And, and the IDF have destroyed, I think, my, my figures may not be 100% correct, but I think they've identified and destroyed around 200 tunnels crossing the border between Gaza and Egypt. I was in one of them myself mm. a few days back in inside Gaza, a tunnel that, that you could easily drive at least two vehicles side by side wow. through that. Wow. And, and that was just one of a huge number of tunnels that, that have been dug by Hamas uh, to, to, to get munitions and not just munitions, but other equipment through, uh, through the border there. And Egypt's been allowing it. And at the same time, Egypt has closed its border to refugees. There are a lot of people from Gaza who could have escaped the war through the Egyptian border, as really is required under international treaty by Egypt, and Egypt just simply refused to do so. It, it, it's mm. one of the few times I'm aware of in history that a neighbouring country that has it's at peace has completely closed off its border to, to refugees from a country that's at war where they're in danger. Richard, I just wanted to ask you very quickly before we let you go, um, just to, to go back to the United States, you know, we had the horrible incident of those six hostages being shot under Rafa uh, the other day. Rafa, of course, was where the Biden administration and Kamala Harris said, do not go in there, you know, leave, leave Rafa alone. Um, and now we have Tim Waltz, who could very well be the next vice president, saying that protesters... Um, who are protesting anti-Israel, pro-Palestine, are protesting for all the right reasons. Have a listen to this here. I think we're at a critical point right now. We need the Netanyahu government to start moving in that direction. But I think those folks who are speaking out loudly in Michigan are speaking out for all the right reasons. It's a humanitarian crisis. Richard, with the uh, presidential election of the U.S. basically being probably a 50-50 toss-up at this point, how much trepidation is there in Israel about the prospect of a Harris-Waltz administration and what they might uh, do in terms of reorienting even further away from Israel? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think, I think the, the Biden administration has been, in many ways, a mixed blessing for Israel. Um, they have provided a great deal of support for Israel. Uh, and, and they've deployed a large number of assets here, and they helped defend Israel. I'm talking about aircraft carrier strike groups, as well as numerous other naval and air assets. Mm. Um, and they helped defend Israel against the Iranian attack on the 14th of April. So, so Israel, the U.S. has been quite strong. But on the other hand, they have been overcritical. And I think every time we've seen comments from the U.S., which suggested a division between Israel and the United States. That's what Hamas capitalized on. That encourages Hamas to keep fighting. And Hamas, you know, they, they, they clearly want to see not just the US, but other countries in the world like Australia, bringing down pressure on Israel to stop the war. Uh, and it's, you know, you mentioned the Kamala, or the, 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 uh, the, the US perspective on Rafa, trying to say this was an impossible operation, which would prove totally wrong by Israel. It's that kind of pressure uh, and that kind of international message which encourages Hamas. And I think mm. it's really important mm. that, the, you know, the, the, if we get a Harris administration, that she doesn't continue to do that. And I think the, the Israelis, most of the Israelis that I speak to, uh, are very concerned about the prospect of another administration like the Biden administration. And, they're, 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 you know, I think above all, they, they would like to see Trump 
in the White House who, whatever anyone thinks of Trump, as far as Israel is concerned, I think he would be, many people over here believe, he would be the best president for Israel and would give them far greater support than they've had up until now. Absolutely. Hard to argue with that. Colonel Richard Kemp, thank you so much for staying up to join us from Israel. Really appreciate it, as always. Now, 